I hope you enjoyed that. I certainly did. Thank you, Kelly. If you have a Bible, would you open it to 1 Peter? I'm going to be saying that a lot to you over the next weeks and months because it will take us a while to get through this book. 1 Peter chapter 1, I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 3. Please follow in your Bibles as I read. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who are the chosen, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, that you may obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in fullest measure. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Would you pause with me as we ask God bless to bless his word. Thank you, Father, for the reading of this, your wonderful word. We pray now that the simple thoughts of this man would not detract from the powerful words that we are looking at. May you write them on the fleshy tablets of our hearts and may, may it cause us to be thankful as your people today. In the wonderful name of Jesus, amen. Like most people, when you come to a body of water and you decide you want to go swimming, you would typically go to the shallowest part, maybe put your foot in to see whether it's really cold or not. And if it was acceptable or you got used to it, then you would go in a little deeper, maybe up to your knees and maybe splash a little water up higher and then maybe walk out waist deep and finally up to your shoulders and, and then you could go swimming. Well, I want you to know Peter's not like that. Peter, if he were to go swimming, based on what we studied last week and what we will see this, uh, this week and coming weeks, Peter would strip down and he would dive into the coldest, deepest into the pool immediately. No hesitation. I want you to notice that we just read the first three verses of his letter of five chapters. Did you notice there was any preamble? Hmm? Did, did, did you see anything that would resemble something of a personal nature like, how's your wife and kids? How's your neighbor Malachi? I remember he was having some trouble with his hips. Greet your family. Greet, greet the church. Do you see any of that in the first three verses? No, of course not. That's not like Peter. He jumps in to the deep end of the pool, and he begins talking about, in these first three verses, one of the most difficult doctrines in all the Bible. It's typically called election, predestination, the foreknowledge of God in salvation. And here we are introduced to it immediately as he begins writing. Now, for the history buffs who are here, you're going to remember that around 64, 65 AD, one of the most important events took place in world history. As a matter of fact, the actual date is recorded for us. It is July 19th, 19, or not 19, 64 AD. July 19th, 64 AD. It's the day that Nero lit Rome on fire. 
He burned the city to the ground. And then as history records, he was off on a mountaintop fiddling while Rome burned. And it burned for three days. It took him three days to put it out. Most of the structures were old and wooden, and thousands of people died. And not only that, he accused the Christians of doing it. Yeah. He said the Christians were the ones who lit Rome on fire. And a huge persecution took place all over the Roman Empire. People were killed. People were burned to death. Their homes destroyed. And so Peter doesn't have time for niceties. He writes around 64, late 64, 65 AD. So this event has just taken place. And this persecution is running rampant throughout the Roman Empire at this time. As a matter of fact, he names the places where it's the worst. Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. Those were all providences where this persecution was the worst. And so he's writing originally to people who were under tremendous persecution. Many of them had lost friends, neighbors, family. And this is one of the worst things that anyone could have conceived of. So Peter doesn't have time for niceties. He doesn't have time for a friendly letter. He goes right into the deep things of God. Look at verse 1 again. He says, who are the chosen? That's who he's writing to, the chosen. And he calls them aliens. Now, these are not from outer space. These are aliens to this world. It's also called strangers. Maybe, maybe it's translated strangers in your Bible. It's the same Greek word, aliens and strangers. We, we the children of God, are aliens and strangers in this world. And so not only did it have immediate application to the people who received the letter, it has had application for centuries right up to this day, including you and me. We are the aliens to planet Earth. We are the strangers on this planet. This world, we have a line, don't we, in a great hymn. This world is not our home. We're just a passing through, right? Famous old hymn. And it's so true. We have got to live like aliens. We've got to remember that this is not the best of life. As a matter of fact, our lives really begin at our physical death. That's when the quality of our lives, as we read about the scriptures going to heaven, is going to be like. What a wonderful time. Now, most of you listening to me today are not my age. As a matter of fact, the longer I live, the fewer of us there are. And I always heard older Christians say to me when I was a younger Christian, you know, heaven is such a wonderful place. I can't wait to get there. And I'd be thinking to myself in my head, well, I can wait. I, I, I've got a few things I'd like to do, you know. But now that I am older, I am that generation, I understand what they're talking about. A lot of my friends, a lot of my family, a lot of the believers that I've known through the years are already up there. They're ahead of me. I look forward to seeing them again. So it, it has a wonderful appeal to me, and it's very real. It's not something I have to hear somebody talk about and then shake my head like I know what they're talking about, but really don't. This is a wonderful truth, church. Aliens. Then he calls them the chosen. You see it in your Bible? Who are the chosen? That's us. Peter introduces us to this very deep and very powerful doctrine 
of the scriptures called election or predestination, the chosen of God, that God chose the people that he wanted to put into his family. We're going to learn more about that in just a moment. But I, I want to tell you about an experience I had as about a two- or three-week-old Christian. The people who led me to Christ, very dear people, and they were from the Dutch Reformed Church of Michigan. And this was a powerful truth to them. They had a, a relative come and visit them. When I was there, I was over at their house, and this relative came in, a lady, and uh, Bern Thule, the husband of the family, introduced me to her. She turned to me, stuck out her hand, and said, are you elect? Now, remember, I'm two to three weeks old in Christ. She didn't even ask me my name. She said, are you elect? Now, I'm thinking to myself in my head, I'm not running for anything, so I don't think I'm elect. So I said, no. I said, no, I don't think I am. She began to give me a lecture about two hours long and hardly took a breath. I mean, she spoke in commas. There were no periods, just, you know, one thought after the next one. And I'm shaking my head like I know what she's talking about. I didn't understand anything that she was saying. Matter of fact, I wondered whether she was even speaking English. Finally, I think she got hungry and decided to give up because I wasn't responding. I mean, I was shaking my head. I was trying to be kind. You know, I didn't, I didn't want to turn her off or walk away or anything. And I was in somebody else's house. I was trying to be kind. But I didn't know what she was talking about. I didn't even have my own Bible yet. I couldn't find Leviticus for Revel from Revelation. And here she is talking to me about this deep, deep, heavy, difficult doctrine called election. Um, can I just give you a warning today <laughs> with this message? If you are still fairly new in the faith, if you're young in Christ, there will be some of this that will go right over your head. But don't worry, it was about four or five years into Christ before any of this began to make sense to me. And even then, it was only on a cursory basis. So get as much as you can, and don't worry about the rest, okay? But we're going to tackle what Peter talks about here. Look at verse 2. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, let's just stop there for a minute. This is telling us that God the Father foreknew his knowledge was beforehand of who he would chose, of who he would choose. That's the end of verse 1. The chosen. Now, the chosen means marked out for special favor. That's what it means. That's what the Greek word chosen means. Marked out for special favor. We're told that God the Father does the choosing. So we know who does the choosing, and we know who the recipients of the choice are, those who are in Jesus Christ. So if you're a believer today in Jesus Christ, you can make personal application to this and say, it's because God chose me. I didn't choose him. He chose me. Now, down here on earth, it could look like you did the choosing, but God did the choosing a long time ago. When did God, God the Father do the choosing of the people who would be in his family? Well, I want you to turn over to Ephesians chapter 1. I want to read another passage to you because it answers that question of when for us. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now watch verse 4. This is very important. Just as he chose us, there's that same word again, 
just as he chose us in him, that is in Jesus Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So when did he choose us? What does the Bible say? Before the foundation of the world, God the Father looked down the corridor of human history and chose you and me to be in his family through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, if that doesn't make you feel special this morning, then you need to take your pulse and see if you're among the living still. Because that's a powerful truth. It's a powerful truth that God the Father picked you. And when did he pick you? Before the foundation of the earth, before creation. He looked all the way down human history to 2022. And he saw you and me. And he put his favor upon us. He chose us. Wow. That is so exciting to me. God the Father did the choosing, and he did it before creation. Now, let's go back to 1 Peter 1, verse 2. He says, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. So, he chose us, and then he sprinkled us with the blood of Christ that we might obey him. Now, this is a term called sanctification. Again, this is a, a long, powerful word, and uh, I'm not bashful about telling you and explaining to you biblical terms, because I think it's important for us to have a handle on what the Bible says. Sanctification is a word that means the process of God making us holy. The process of God making us holy. He chose us, and then he sanctifies us. He cleanses us on a regular basis. Who does that? What did your Bible say? Well, let's go back and read it again, because you're looking at me like, uh, I'm not sure. Okay, let's look. Verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Now, your Bible should be a capital S. That means the Holy Spirit. This is the job of the Holy Spirit, is to sanctify the chosen ones of God. That's what he does. He sanctifies it. How does he do that? Well, do you remember the last time you were about to sin? You were enticed to sin? Don't look at me like that. Like you have no idea what I'm talking about. Stop that. You know what I mean. You were enticed to sin and you heard something. What did you hear? Don't do that, Jerry. Stop thinking that. That's the active voice of the Holy Spirit working on the sanctification of Jerry Mitchell. And you too. He urges us not to sin. And when we do sin, he urges us to confess it as quickly as possible so that we aren't out of fellowship with the Lord through our sin. We get back into relationship with him. I'll show you a verse on that in just a second. But first I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story about my sanctification or, in my case, lack of same. I got up one morning, and it was early, and so I determined I was going to have some quiet time with the Lord. Some, some people call it a devotional time. 
Some people call it a quiet time. So I got up and I had a sweet prayer time. Sweet prayer time with the Lord. You know how you get together with the Lord in prayer and then thoughts in prayer just kind of are just rolling? Man, I was having such a good time in prayer. And then I decided to meditate on some of my favorite verses. Meditation is a great form of sanctification because it's the cleansing power of the Word of God inside of us. Then I did some Bible reading. I don't know, maybe an hour, hour and a half in total. Don't always spend that much time in my devotions, just to just to be honest with you, so you don't think, well, Pastor Jerry is so holy. He gets up and spends hours with the Lord every day. No, I don't. But I did this day. And I, when I was done, I thought to myself, this is going to be such a good day. When I get done with this day and when I lay down on my pillow tonight to go to sleep, I'm going to look back on today and this is going to be one of the best days I've ever had in my whole life as a Christian. Then the phone rang, and it was a very angry man. And the longer he talked, the more he got angry with me. He was like Mount Vesuvius. He was exploding, and he had lava all over my room. I had ash on myself, and I could just feel. You know how you feel when your anger starts to grow? And it's coming up, and you, you want to hold it down, but you, you can't. And here it comes. And there it is, right in my face. And my sanctified day was gone. It was gone. Matter of fact, by the time I, I hung up with him, I was just about as raging a bull as he was when he called. I had to go for a walk probably 20, 30 minutes, I had to confess to the Lord, not once, not twice, not three times, four times before I began to get back on track again. That's how you lose your sanctification. And I lost it. You say, well, this must have happened a long time ago, Pastor, because you're so much older and so mature now. About three months ago. Yeah. I was still the same age I am now. You can lose your sanctification just like that. That's what sin is like. What does Proverbs say? It's like a lying waiting at the door. <laughs> don't, don't open the door because it will eat you alive. Well, the job of the Holy Spirit, and he never quits. He never gives up. He never is tired. He never says, you know what, Mitchell? You're a lost cause. I am tired of correcting you. I am tired of filling you. I am tired of your antics. Never. Never. So, his job is to confront our personal sin, to urge us to ask the Lord's forgiveness, to be put back into fellowship with the Lord. Okay, I'm going to turn to a passage. And you know how sometimes I urge you to memorize a scripture we look at? Here's one that I would love for you to put to memory. 1 John 1, 9. If you don't already have this verse memorized, then you should put this verse to memory. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from, what does your Bible say? 
all unrighteousness. He leaves no stones unturned. Doesn't matter what it was. If we confess it, he is faithful and he will forgive. Praise God. Put that to memory and use it. Because you know what? I know our adversary. I've fought with him all of my Christian life. 55 years, I fought with the devil. And he wants to come and say, you know what, that's it. You're over the line. That's too many. He won't forgive you anymore. You ever heard that before? Oh, I have. Don't you believe it? Your Bible says all unrighteousness. And he will put us back in fellowship with God. And it's like whatever happened is gone. He sprinkles it. By the way, you you know that concept that Peter talks about, the sprinkling with blood? He, He draws upon his own experience as a Jew in in the in the um, the worship and religious ceremonies of the Jewish people. They would bring a spotless lamb, and the father of the household he could he could represent ten people, ten people, and he would put his hands on the lamb, and he would confess his sin, and then the priest would kill the lamb and sprinkle the lamb's blood on the mercy seat as a symbol that they've been forgiven. God heard you, he forgives you. Well, we don't have to do that anymore because Jesus Christ shed his own blood. He was the Lamb of God. And so we don't need to do that anymore. But we do need to confess. I once had a Christian say to me, I haven't confessed a sin in three months. Young man. It's always the young guys. Young man comes and says, I haven't confessed my sins in three months. I said, really? And how do you feel? And he looked down at the floor and said, I feel dirty. I said, well, that means the Spirit of God is working in your life. I said, let's, let's walk over here and, and you just spend some time confessing. And I'll stand here with you as your witness. And when you're done, I'll close in prayer and thank God for your forgiveness. And he did. He backed up his truck and he unloaded. You can avoid asking forgiveness, but you'll feel dirty. So do it often. Do it, as, do it as often as it happens. Do it as often as the Spirit of God says to you. You know what you said the other day? That was sin. You know what you thought? You know what you did? Confess it. It's gone. Okay, verse 3. Back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Living hope. Does that sound familiar to anybody here? Yeah. I don't know if the founders named this church on this verse or not, but here it is in your Bible. Living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So remember... Christians that Peter's writing to are under intense persecution because of Nero. What should Christians focus on when they're in tough times? They should focus on their living hope. It's a living hope. It's not a dead hope. It's it's not a pie in the sky by and by hope. It's a now hope. It's a real hope. It's a living hope. It's available to us every single minute of the day. 
Why do so many people in the world hate Christians? You know, I, tr I tried to make the world my friend when I was a young Christian. I just got, I really got slapped around for that. Why do they hate us? Because we tell them that heaven is our home. And they can go there too. We invite them to come with us. But if they don't repent of their sins and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they can't go to heaven. And you know what? It makes them mad. And Jesus isn't here to take it out on. So guess what? They take it out on us. Church, you remember 9-11? The collapse of the two towers in New York and the plane into the Pentagon? The day after, people started writing that it was the fault of the evangelical Christians. I've got articles. I kept them. Here's how the argument went. You evangelical Christians preach a gospel that makes the Muslims mad. And if you would just shut your mouths, they wouldn't be so angry with us. And they wouldn't have crashed those planes into those towers or the Pentagon. It's your fault. I've got articles that say that. You may not remember that. But I remember it. I got nasty phone calls because I'm an evangelical pastor. They focus their hatred on us, but especially on the leaders. Came after us. They hate us. We invite them to go to heaven with us. When they say no, they get angry and they take their anger out on Jesus, but we're the ones available. So you can try and make friends with the world if you want to, but it's a dead end. I'll guarantee it. It's a cul-de-sac. And you'll find that out if you try. Doesn't mean you're to hate them. We're to love them and to reach out to them. Matter of fact, I'm reminded of a Bible verse on that very subject before we leave it. It's in Matthew chapter 5. Verse 11, blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely. And then what does it say? On account of me, Jesus said. Why do they do that? They do it on account of Jesus. He's not here, he's in heaven. So they take it out on us. So don't be surprised when it happens. When Christians die, that's our greatest day. Our greatest day. Now, you might not think that right now, but I guarantee when it happens, it will be your greatest day. That's when life really begins. You remember Doubting Thomas? He's my favorite apostle. Favorite. You say, really? Ah. When Jesus rose from the dead, he met with the ten disciples in the upper room. Thomas wasn't there. Where was he? Were they, were they having a sale on sandals at Costco? He, he just couldn't miss out on? No, he knew about the meeting. He got the name Doubting Thomas for a reason. They all told him they had seen Jesus. They had a meeting with him. He said, no... No, you didn't. I won't believe it unless I put my finger in the nail holes and I put my hand in his side. And they, they stayed on him and they stayed on him and they stayed on. Finally, he said, okay, okay, I'll come to your meeting, but I don't believe. When he got there, Jesus was there. Doors were closed, windows were closed, and suddenly Jesus was in their presence, and he goes right over to Thomas. He says to Thomas, Thomas, 
See that nail hole? Go ahead, put your finger in there. Pulls his robe. See that scar? Put your hand in there. And stop being unbelieving, but believe. Can you imagine that? One of Christ's apostles, after the whole three years of being with him, he didn't believe. He didn't. He needed more evidence. By the way, you've got some doubting Thomases in your life. Don't give up on those people. They just need more evidence. Don't give up. Keep reaching out to them. Give them as much evidence as they need. Pray for them. What did Thomas say after that event? He said, my kurios and my theos, my Lord and my God. And Thomas would preach the gospel to his dying breath. He got it. Oh, he got it. Let me give you a couple of applications, and then we'll be done today. Number one, if we sin, and we do, don't give me that pious look. Confess it quickly and get back in fellowship with the Lord. The only detergent that can cleanse our souls is the sprinkled blood of Jesus Christ. Only detergent. Nothing else will do. Secondly, take a moment before you leave the building today, while it's still on your mind, and thank him for choosing you. We were sinners. We're not better than anybody else. But he picked us. He chose us. We give him the credit. Not some of the credit. We give him all the credit. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, and he found us. Would you join me in closing prayer? Thank you, Lord, for these truths. Some of these are hard to understand, but we thank you that you have written them down for us and that over a longer period of time as we wrestle with your choice of us, it will seep into our souls. But we want to say to you today before we leave, thank you, Lord, for picking us. You made it abundantly clear in your word today that you were the one before creation that chose us to be your own. And we want to say thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.